them very, very much for taking this class. It's one that I've never taught before, okay? So to make a long story short, I'm going to be learning a lot as we go through this as well. Uh, I'm going to be studying just like you're studying. I'm going to be hopefully helping you. And what we're trying to do in this class is to learn together. All righty. I've always been challenged as a teacher because my students have always challenged me to be better, to do better, and I have to dig a lot more. And that's the reason why I love to teach, uh, especially at the Georgia School of Preaching, and, and get involved in doing this. This class is dealing with a lot of hot topic items right here, right now. And the bottom line is, is that as we're studying this together, we have to remember above everything else that we're Christians, and we're trying to find out what God says about this situation. I am sure that on some of these things, we will have disagreements. In fact, I'm not a betting man, but I think I can take this one to the bank knowing beyond any shadow of a doubt that there will be some disagreements. You know what I'm trying to say? I can make money on this one. And we can even have it in the church. But again, and this is where we're going to start off this morning or this afternoon, we're going to start talking about what is the the standard that we're striving to go by in this particular class. Okay. So as we start off, we have some things we've got to go over because that's just things we have to start with. This is a three semester hour class. We uh, have been uh, over the last, excuse me just a moment. Uh, the last two semesters, we have gone 18 hours, two hours of class. This time we're going 15 classes for two and a half hours. So I will give you breaks, all righty? And I know you will need them. And um, so we're working through this together. This class, according to the course description, and you have it there on the syllabus, and we're going to go through the syllabus very quickly so everybody understands where we're coming from up front. It's always good whenever you start talking about ethics, about knowing what the standard is. In this class, the syllabus is the standard, all righty? It has to be that way. So this description is the ethical, the Christian ethics is going to be the ethical conduct in light of Bible teaching. All right. That's key. In light of Bible teaching, we'll be studied. And again, we're going to be talking about abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, capital punishment, war, uh, a lot of sexual issues, uh, homosexuality, divorce and remarriage, transgenderism, reproductive technology, pornography. Uh, we're going to be talking about cloning, generic, genetic engineering, gambling, racism. Um, <clears throat> and again, there are a lot of other things that we could talk about. Uh, alcoholism. You know, there's just a lot of things we could spend a lot of time on, but we've only got 15, uh, 15 weeks of two and a half hours of class. So there's not going to be a real good way that we're going to be able to cover these in as much depth as we need to. And again, this is part of the reason why I'm glad you're here because you're going to help me to study and know so that we can learn together. This also, this particular class is required. Uh, we started at four different schools in the Georgia School of Preaching, the School of Preaching, the School of Biblical Studies, the School of uh, Mission, and the School of Leadership. This particular course is required in the school or on the school, under the School of Leadership. And so we're going to be talking a lot here as well about trying to emphasize how leadership can address these issues in the church. All righty, so that's what's important as we look at that. You're going down a little bit further, you see my name, address, and telephone number. I will not give you my bank routing number or my bank account number or my social security number. I love you guys, but I'm not gonna do that, all right? Uh, the bottom line is you see my email address, didoskalos. Many people ask the question, what does this word didoskalos mean? That is the Greek word for teacher. Okay, the Oscalos 1102, that's my birthday, at gmail.com, and my phone number is 770-365-2133. So, no, no, I, well, that's a good thing, too. I could be asking a lot, too. You're right. So, good, good point there. Good point. Good point. So, check your email. Uh, for messages uh, and any other GSOP personnel, make sure your mail mailbox is not full. Make sure it doesn't go to spam. Uh, I will send you out every week an invitation. If you can't be here in the class, if you have access to a computer at your house, you will be able to watch it from home. Okay. 
and you'll be able to interact just like uh, here. All right. So that's part, part of what we're doing. Also, another thing that I try to do, and we've been trying to do this for a little bit, is I'm recording these lessons so that after, after this class is over, I will go back and upload this to my YouTube page. And if you were unable to attend, or even if you were able to attend and you want to go back over the class and discuss some more of the things or read it, look at some of the things we discussed, I will send you a link on the email. And all you have to do is click on that link and it'll take you to the YouTube page. Okay. So I'm trying to make this as, as student friendly as I possibly can, but also to get you to the point to where you're able to um, deal with what you got to deal with, and especially when it comes to your assignments. Um, instructor, if you do not hear from you, email me at this particular email address, and I will try to get back to you within 24 hours. Now, also understand that I am an elder, and I also am a preacher, and I also try to, did you hear the word, try to direct this school here, direct this campus, and I have uh, eight grandchildren, and I'm married, and so the bottom line is I'm kind of a busy fellow. So sometimes I will not, don't think if I don't immediately answer you that I'm mad at you or something like that. I'm just living life, okay? So just understand that's what's going on there. All right, uh, tell me everything you need to know on all the problems. Each week, uh, we're going to have weekly summaries of what you've read in the required text. Again, a lot of the weekly tests, which will form the basis of the midterm and the final test. All righty. Let me tell you my philosophy on tests. I shared this with you some before, but some of you don't know this. Years ago, whenever I was going, I was a freshman at the University of North Alabama. And uh, there was a professor there that was teaching American government. And in this class, he had us buy the book and he would ask the questions. And so what he would do, everybody in the University of North Alabama took his classes because these were the easiest A's in the world. And here's was his philosophy. And I kind of buy into this. His philosophy was, look, he says, I am not going to give you a bunch of material for you to cram for and try to get it in your head. So you could take a test, walk out of the room, and promptly forget it. What I'm trying to do as a professor is to help you, and this is what he was saying, know that whenever you're looking for the information, you know where to look to find it. So what he would do is he would ask a question in class and he would say, open your books to such and such a page. He would be reading down through there. He said, now on the midterm and the final, this question will be here and he will ask the question. And he told us the first day of class, he said, write the question in the margins of your book and underline the answer. And when I give you the test, it's open book, open note. So if you've got the test question and you know where the answer is, all you've got to do is write down the answer and that's all. And I thought so many years after that, I thought, well, that's the reason why everybody took his class, easy A's. But that's also, he's right because all of us know that we're not going to keep everything crammed in our heads. We, we, in our minds, we have a certain limit about how much we could put up there. And if we don't use it every day, what's going to happen? You don't use it. What you lose it. So the bottom line is, is I am not so much interested as to whether or not you can cram for a test and give me that information back and regurgitate it to me. I don't care about that. What I'm going to care about is whether or not you know where to find it and how to get, how to find it. Okay. So you see where I'm coming from. So you might say this may be the easiest class in the world and it could be, but it's going to be dependent upon you. You still got to do the work. Okay. I want to emphasize that idea. Uh, I want you to participate in discussions and all the, all of this, and then I would like for you, if you're taking this for credit, to give us a paper of about 10 to 15 pages on one of the topics that we have listed in the syllabus, okay? And we get down through there. Now, the book. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking for this. This is a copy of the book. This is second edition. Norman Giesler wrote this book, Christian Ethics. Now, he is not a member of the Lord's Church, but... At the same time, he is one of the best thinkers in the brotherhood, 
or in the, he's one of the best thinkers when it comes to proofs for Christianity and so forth. By the way, he died July the 1st, 2019 of this year. So uh, this is up to date as of 2010. And he added a great deal more to this particular book. And so as you're looking at this, uh, we're going to be talking about this in a lot of detail. And so that's, this is going to be the, the, as it was, the basis of this. Yes, ma'am. He was, he, he was, uh, he's not a member of the Church of Christ. He was working for some others. So we'll, we'll talk about that some more, okay? Okay? All righty. So that's, <clears throat> he is a, he was a very, very, very smart man. All righty. And uh, that's the reason why we're going to use his particular book. There are some other books out there. Uh, I was trying to do some research to get ready for this class. I talked to uh, Dave Miller from Apologetics Press. He taught this class before at the Brown Trail Road School of Preaching, but all of the material he gave and sent to me was written back in the 1980s, and a lot of the issues that we're dealing with today wasn't even beginning to be discussed at that point in time. So that's the reason why I'm trying to find something more up to date, and this is the reason why we're using this particular book. All righty, you'll look down through there in the... Uh, Okay, let me go back here for just a minute. All right, as you continue to go through the syllabus, <clears throat> uh, the tentative weekly topics. Tonight will be the introduction to class, which is what we're going through here, the requirements that you need to do, the outline of the paper requirements, and we're going to start today to talk about ethics. We're going to start talking about where we get the ideal of ethics and the standard of morality. And we'll begin with our view of scripture. Uh, we will talk about next week, uh, continuation of that study. Then we'll start going to get into the actual issues themselves, abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia, capital punishment, war. Uh, these are in no particular order, okay? I did, however, try to get a lot of them in order from the calm chapters of the book, all righty? But we might jump around as we're going through, all right? Because a lot of these things will be tied in together as we look at this. All right, so if you'll look at the next page, it says assignments by week. And I don't have assignments every week. I will give you an assignment every week. This is a new class. So I will give you an assignment every week, depending upon what we studied last week and what I want you to get ready for the next week. All righty? So that's mainly what I'm going to be looking at as we look through these assignments. All righty. Now, GSOP grading policies. This is, uh, this is stuff that we all need to be aware of. Uh, it's pretty well that way in a lot of other colleges. 100 is 100, an A is 100 to 90, 89 to 80, 79 to 70. It's based on the 10, so keep that in mind. A grade of failing is considered as final and will appear on the student's GSOP permanent record and transcript. If you have an incomplete, and if you do not get the work in on a specific time frame specified by the instructors, then that will be turned into an F and you'll have to take the course all over again. Uh, if you decide that you don't want to take this course for credit, okay, I understand that. A lot of folks want to do that. Then you have three weeks from the first class to decide whether to change it from credit to audit or not. All right? Three weeks. All righty. And you've got to let me know in that time frame. All right? Hardship cases. Let me tell you another little story. I like to tell stories. Whenever I was um, in... Magnolia Bible College years ago in Mississippi. My wife, we were just starting, we just got married. We had a son. My wife had a son. And in six weeks after having that son, she had to have her gallbladder taken out. Fun times. I was trying to go to school, trying to preach for this little church in Mississippi, and trying to take care of a sick wife. And there was about a period of about six weeks I didn't go to school. And when I showed back up to school down there, they said, we thought you had withdrawn. I said, no, this is what's been happening. Nobody called me and tried to find out what was going on. I had my hands full. And they let me make up that six weeks of work, plus helped me the rest of that time frame to the point to where I was able 
pass the classes. I am a very benevolent dictator. Okay, I have been treated very nicely before, and the bottom line is, uh, I am a benevolent dictator. However, I will not, you know, I will not allow somebody to go two semesters before they finally get me this grade in. That's not going to happen. You know, if you can't get it taken care of in a certain amount of time, then you let me know and I'll work with you on it. But a year later, no, I'm not going to take the grade then. You just got to take it all over again. So you, you see what I'm trying to say. All right. Again, class participation plays an important part in the student's grade. We enforce attendance standards if you're taking it for credit, if you're absent from more than four class sessions, unless the absences are due to an extreme hardship. That's what I just explained, right? Uh, he or she will be required to retake the course at a later time. So if you can, let me know. Some of you have already let me know that you're not going to be here already, and that's fine. All righty? Uh, disclaimer. You know, every document has to have a disclaimer. Every legal document has to have a disclaimer, all righty? Uh, textbook recommended age, bibliographic entries, and assigned articles do not necessarily reflect the views of the instructor, the faculty, and the administration, all righty? <clears throat> all human authors are fallible, period. Materials are selection, selected for their instructional value, and uh, including the presentation of diverse viewpoints, and, and that's part of what we're doing here. We're trying to learn from one another, and there will, as I said before, there will be diversity viewpoints. So you need to learn how to do, evaluate these materials to know the difference error and to know the positive contribution. The paper, unless specified otherwise by the professor, all course papers must be typewritten. Notice the word typewritten. Nowadays it's what? Document, Word document, <laughs> all righty. So you see that's been dated a little bit in the proper thesis form in the MLA format. And again, all you got to do to get that, I've given you the link right there, okay? I've given you the link, so let me encourage you to do that. Uh, again, check your email. Uh, if you have any changes to your personal address, telephone numbers, email address, please let us know. Let the uh, registrar know, and uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, we accept students from all walks of life, no gender, racial, doctoral, socioeconomic barrier that prevent anybody from attending ESOP classes. However, this is a Christian school, so we expect proper conduct, right? Christian conduct. Well, wait a minute, we're talking about Christian ethics here. So yeah, Christian conduct, all righty? Respect for other people. Um, you may disagree with people in this class, and that's okay, but you need to do it out of love, all right? Because that's what we're striving to be, and that's what we're trying to do. Again, I'm given the freedom to conduct the respective courses. I seem best, so again, we're gonna try to equitably enforce all the requirements, give attention to tardiness, and again, we're gonna try to be respectful of you as we expect you to be respectful of us. There is no cost for this school. Um, no matriculation fees. Uh, it is pretty well supported by the various congregations where the school is located. Um, and that's the reason why we expect you to buy your own material. Now, years ago, we used to have a books club or bookstore here. Uh, what wound up happening is um, nobody would buy the books from the bookstore. They would get it online. <laughs> Or something like that. So now you're the one responsible to buy your own book. Okay. And that's, that's the reason why we're, we're not going to run that in that respect. Uh, <clears throat> again, all the instructors have taught. We, I, for, if you want to know a little bit about me, uh, I have graduated from uh, uh, International Bible College. I've graduated from Magnolia Bible College, which is now a defunct college. And, um, I uh, have gone back to Heritage Christian, got my master's degree, okay? I would like to go back and get some more, but um, you remember that thing I talked to you about earlier about being a preacher and an elder and, and, a, and, and this class teacher? I don't know where I'm going to put in another time to go back to school. So that's, so anyway. And if any of you do decide you want to help me to go back and want to help pay my way, let me know, and I'll talk with you after class, too, all right? Uh, <clears throat> so... Um, Again, this is a Christian school, 
So again, adhere to the highest standards of honesty and integrity and Christian principles. No plagiarism. Again, we've heard into some of that here where uh, we do know, or not at this particular school, but at other schools where uh, in the sermon design and delivery course, we knew of a young man that went and copied a bunch of sermons that was not his, but he had put it out there like it was his. That's not going to work. Okay. Uh, it, it, you know, and all it really, it, it's really sad because all he did was go through there, found them on the computer, copied and pasted them and presented them as if they were his. <laughs> no, that, that's not going to work at all. All right. Again. So we're trying to be what God or what God wants and what God expects of us to be. All righty. So any questions on this? We will, as I said, end the second week in December. We will have a week off for Thanksgiving. All righty. So, and that's worked out. So December 12th will be the final class, final exam, and the paper will be due at that point in time. Are there any questions about this? Now, I know many of you are taking this for audit, but I also know for a fact that some are you taking for credit. So this is part of the reason why we spend this time to, to, to really try to go into detail about this. All right. Now, let's start talking about this idea. When we start talking about Christian ethics, let's, let's define our terms first off. First off, when we start defining this, we deal with the term philosophy. What is philosophy? The what? The way, you see things. the way we see things. It actually comes from two Greek words, philo, which means love. Again, the Greeks had three different types of love, okay? There's agape, phileo, and uh, storge, actually four, uh, storge. Uh, so this is love. And then Sophia, I have six granddaughters. I watch Sophia all the time. Uh, anyway, Sophia means wisdom, okay? It just simply means wisdom. So philosophy is a love of wisdom. A love of knowledge, all right? And that's what we're talking about. We, we, we want to know more. We want to understand more. We want to be able to know more and be able to, to talk in a way that, that is clear to everybody and everybody understands where we're coming from. And this is it. But there's a lot of philosophies out there. There's a lot of different ideas about what we should follow and how we should follow these things, all righty? Then you have this word ethics. All right. Now the word ethics comes from again a Greek word ethos. Ethos. All right, ethos. And again, it simply means the science of study. Uh, again, the the idea dictionary.com defines ethics as moral principles that governs a person's behavior or the con conduct of an activity. So as we start thinking about this for just a moment, as we've gone through this syllabus, this is the moral principles that's going to guide your study here as we're gathering together because we're conducting the activity of what? Studying the Bible, studying what God wants and what God expects of us to be. So, Sometimes we hear, well, medical ethics. What does that mean? What are the medical moral codes? Whenever we start actually getting into a lot of this cloning, when we start talking about abortion, when we start talking about other, some of these other things, we will start talking about met medical moral standards. And again, doctors have to go through a lot of these moral codes and, and what's right and what's wrong. What do you do? I think, again, sometimes, did you hear the word I think? That means what? Always be aware when I say the word I think, because it always emphasizes the ideal of my opinion. But the thing is, is that a lot of times we, when it comes to a lot of different things, we have so many different moral codes and moral standards there that sometimes we don't even know what the best one is. Example, many, 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 many years ago, before the advent of medical science to the point to where it is today, most people would get sick. They would call for a doctor. The doctor would come to their house. Yes. Wow. 
totally shocking concept, okay? He would treat you there at your house and get you hopefully better. But if not, then, you know, by and large, he would treat you. And then again, if you were about to die, he would be there to maybe help you as you passed. It wasn't these long, hard battles with cancer or something like that, that, that really prolongs the life of somebody when sometimes prolonging that life was really not, you know, the life that they have to live at that point in time later becomes what? It becomes pure misery. So you see, it's these, it's these kind of things. Who's getting rich now? It's the medical companies and the pharmaceutical companies and all these others that are saying you need this. Uh, uh, you know, somebody was telling me the other day, they went to see somebody, a uh, 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 skin doctor, dermatologist, and they said, yeah, we see all the skin cancer up there. We need to start cutting it and cutting and cutting and getting this all off of you. And it's like, um, I'm 78 years old. <laughs> Why do you need to start cutting on me right now? There's no need of that. You know, I'm not going to live that much longer. But they were wanting to do all of that because it could do this. Well, you know what? The Bible's clear. We're not going to get out of here alive, right? So for the Christian, dying is not the worst thing in the world. For me to live as Christ and die as gain. And so you see, because we're living by a different standard, then I don't know that, uh, you know, we have the right to make a lot of our decisions. My mother-in-law passed away about, about a month or so ago. <clears throat> and she had been taken to the hospital, and they were going to start all this big treatment. She said, no, you're not. I want to go home. So we took her home. And she died at home the way she wanted to with her family surrounding her. You see, there's nothing in the world wrong with that. But you see the point I'm trying to make. When you've got medical ethics, moral codes, and again, what's, what's the moral code of medicine? Keep the patient alive as long as possible, right? Well, you can keep the patient alive hooked up to every machine in the world, but is the patient really, does that, do they have really the quality of life that we understand that God wants and expects of us to have. That's a whole other issue, right? Mm -hmm. So that's part of what we're talking about here. We're talking about moral principles, all right? <laughs> different philosophies have different ideas about what is right and what is wrong, all right? And that's where I was encouraging some of you to go ahead and pick up the book. How many of you have had the chance to read any of this yet? Two of you, all right? The first four or five chapters are kind of tough, isn't it? <laughs> because, <laughs> because, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it, and you're sitting there just struggling with with him. It is as I was reading through this and trying to find out. All right, I'm going to try to emphasize the main points here. And the problem is the way he wrote. Just about every sentence was important, <laughs> and that's what really began to to blow my mind a little bit here. So the bottom line is is we have to understand some of these philosophies. And then we, and the better we understand these philosophies, then the better we will then be able to understand where our culture is coming from. All right, now, again, go back to, uh, let's go back to the 1940s, even before that 1930s. Um, it was the time of the depression there was a lot of suffering by a lot of people in this country at that point in time. Uh, there were people that were amoral and glorified for it. And a lot of times, even today, we still see movies glorifying them. I remember watching Bonnie and Clyde years ago. Okay, that was a cool movie. I thought, man, that, that is cool. Here's the guys that's fighting the system. Yay for them. And whenever you start finding out, they killed something like five or ten police officers plus other people in the, in the process of this, all to gain money. You know, and you talk about all those guys that did that. Well, they were living by a, quote, different moral standard. But what was the thing there? At that time, the United States pretty well had a moral standard. Go to church, you know. We're trying to follow what the Bible says. We go into World War II. 
And then we start seeing a bunch of other cultures that have a lot that don't even have the same moral standards at all. Hitler, all right? If you listen to a lot of people today, and I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but just kind of get, this is an introductory class. Some people today will make the argument, well, Hitler claimed to be a Christian. Well, again, you can claim to be a Christian and not be a Christian, right? So we have to understand, well, what's, where is the moral standard that decides who is and who isn't a Christian? The evolutionists will make the argument, you know, hey, look, he was a Christian man, so if you're going to really get down to the nitty-gritty of it, Hitler was more on the side of Christians than he was on the side of evolution. But read Menkamp. See what he actually did. He actually thought what? That one race of people wasn't worth living, and he did his best to obliterate them. Six million-plus Jews, and that's not going to include the other five million of others that he had killed. Okay, so we have him on that one side. There was another fellow by the name of Stalin. Now, what about Stalin? Well, he again, you go back and you read a little bit about communism and how it started. Lenin had actually studied to be a Catholic priest. Stalin killed between the war and after the war, over 18 million people. Most of them his own people. Yeah, most of them his own people. The Chinese, the Japanese during World War II. Think about the rape of China, the rape of Nanking. Mm -hmm. These people were vicious. And again, we had to have fight a war. And so we come out of the war thinking, okay, well, we'll come back to this good standard. And, and especially, you know, a lot of churches, they would say, you know what this world needs is Christ. And that's when the missionary fervor of the Lord's church really exploded. Boy, people would go back to some of these places and start preaching the gospel, set up churches all over the place. The church was <clears throat> growing by leaps and bounds in the 50s and the 60s. And then the 60s happened. And what happens about that time frame? Well, a lot of the young people, and they say, well, who sets the standards? And about that same time, there was a war going on in a little small place called Vietnam. My dad fought in Vietnam. And again, you start looking at all that's going on there. And again, what was it all about? Well, it was under the purview of what? Well, we need to stop communism. You see, there were clear lines. Capitalism versus communism, socialism. Now those lines are totally blurred today. And now we actually have people arguing in, in the halls of Congress for socialism and for communism. <laughs> Even though as you go back and you sit and look and see how it's already not worked out in other countries, they sit back and say, well, that's still the best thing to do. Why? Okay. So in your, in your, the way you're describing the ethics and Christian ethics, are mm -hmm. you saying that communism and um, is a non-Christian ethic and that you can't be a Christian and a communist? Is that, is that like the, your argument or your, your thread? I haven't really gotten to that point where Christians come in here now. I'm just okay, trying to bring that out. I'm just trying different. in different senses, okay? I was confused about because yeah. you're talking about the 50s here in the, in the U.S. and I assume mm -hmm. that you're referring to them as being Christian, mm -hmm. Christian ethics, so yeah. I, that's where I got to. Yeah, and I apologize, and I, that's why I need you to talk to me, okay? <laughs> so that everybody talks to me, so if you get confused, you let me know, okay? But that's kind of that was kind of the way, the point I was trying to make in the 50s or 60s, it seemed like that there was a lot of people that agreed that this is what needed to happen. We were still living by somewhat Christian principles. But at the same time, there was a lot that wasn't. And they were being raised up. And again, that the young people of the 60s, and hey, I'm a, I was born in 1960, okay? So, you know, I, I saw a lot of that. And I thought a lot of that was pretty cool stuff, you know, and, and what they were doing was pretty cool. And, and so as you, you start growing up in that culture and begin what began, begins to happen, everybody's shifting away from what, they're, they're shifting away from the agreement that God's way is the best. And they're now beginning to, 
listen to more to evolutionary ideas. They're beginning to, and evolutionary ideas would also be found very much so in capitalism, or excuse me, in communism, socialism, some of these things. So again, every one of these, they're all tied together in so many different ways. And you hear a lot of people today even emphasize the idea that socialism is what Christ would stand for. Well, the question is, is that really what he would stand for? As an introductory, we're going to just simply say here that as we continue to look at this, we might see that the way Christ actually, and some of the things he's taught in the Bible would go against what some would argue is socialism and definitely would go against what some would argue is communism. But some will take some passages and say, now, okay, Jesus was for communism. That the early church was communistic. The early church was socialistic. And we're going to look at that, all right? We're going to look at that and compare that with what the Bible really says about all of that. All righty? So that's kind of where we are today. And again, you could go through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and now we're here we are at 2019, about to enter a new decade, and look where we are. Um, our culture has changed drastically with the advent of the internet. It has changed even that much more rapidly. Now, if you want to find out anything about anything, you go on Google and find out anything about anything. And, you know, we kind of jokingly say this, well, everything on the internet is true. No, it's not. <laughs> no, no, it's not, you know. Uh, that that commercial a few years ago. Well, if it's on the if it's on the internet, it has to be true. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's a place to compete for ideas. And nowadays, especially in Facebook, Instagram, some of these other things, what we have is we're not having honest discussions about these issues as much as we're demonizing the opponents, and that's not right. And the thing that, I, that breaks my heart is when I see Christians demonizing opponents rather than trying to lead them to what Christ would want and trying to lead them to what Christ would expect in these situations. So as we start, and, and I'm going to take about a 10-minute break in here in just a moment, and then we'll come back and start off by emphasizing for about the next hour or so our view of Scripture. I want us to understand where we're coming from. I want us to understand what is our standard. So if we start looking at it from our view of Scripture, and then we begin then to try to apply that view of Scripture to all of these other problems, and that's what I'm going to try to do for the next 15 weeks, is try to apply Scripture to every one of these issues that comes up. I will also say, and I've said it before, but I will also say there will be disagreements, all right? And uh, I'll give you just a very quick one, and then we'll break for just a moment. In the 1800s, um, right before the days and the advent of the Civil War, there were brethren in the church, Alexander Campbell, Moses Lard, uh, David Lipscomb, that made the argument that no Christian should ever be engaged in war. And you can actually read their writings, and they believed that it was wrong for Christians to be engaged in war. Lipscomb, in his book, The uh, <clears throat> Civil Government, was writing during the heat of the Civil War in the United States and said this, how can a Christian brother in the South kill a Christian brother from the North and make his wife a widow and his children orphans? Foy Wallace came in a little bit later on in the 1930s, 1940s, right before the time of the Uh, World War II, after World War I into World War II, he wrote a book, The Christian and the Civil Government, and argued that it was right and indeed necessary for Christians to engage in war. Now, <clears throat> you want to do a great study on this, you, you read those and you read and you start comparing them. This is the kind of thing we're going to be talking about as we go in this class. All righty? I will give you my opinions, but I will always try to emphasize they're my opinions. All right. All right. Let's take about a ten minute break. No, I'm from the United States. 
glad to see you again. Thank you. So now we're going to actually start getting into our view of scripture. All right. And a lot of this material came from, if you had the opportunity to do it, a lot of this material did come from um, <clears throat> uh, Phil Sanders in, in a, a recent one course, but I'm going to try to even add to that a little bit more. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Most of us know this passage. We should probably quote it, but there are some things here he emphasizes that, again, we, we need to stress. <clears throat> he says, beginning in verse 10, and, and this is important to me, whenever you're studying anything from Scripture, always look at it from a, a, the whole context. Beginning in verse 10, he says, you have carefully, talking to Timothy here, remember the Tim, Paul wrote this, this was his last book that he wrote. He was writing from a Roman prison. He was about to die. Uh, and so understand, he says, you have carefully followed my doctrine. Well, what does the word doctrine mean? His teaching, his manner of life. That word doctrine actually suggests the idea of his teaching. He said, you have followed further than that my manner of life. So Paul practiced what he preached. And he would over and over again as he's talking to the Corinthians. And also, as we know in 1 Timothy, he left uh, Timothy at Ephesus. We know that his manner of life was something that Timothy exemplified as well. He said, you have followed my purpose. Okay. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. He said, you have followed my purpose, my faith. Well, faith comes by and hearing by the word of God. You have followed my long suffering. That Greek word there is an interesting word. It means you're long nosed. You, you look past a lot of things. God is long suffering, right? Go back in Exodus chapter 34, six and seven. And he emphasizes, that's one of the great characteristics of God. God is long suffering. He's long nosed. He looks way past things because he's wanting to give us more time. He says, you know, my love. And my perseverance, my persecutions and afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. <clears throat> and that was on that first missionary journey. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. And he says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All right, I love that. We just need to remind ourselves of that. If we're going to do what's right, there are going to come times and I think especially as we're talking about this Christian ethics class, it's important for us to realize that if you're going to stand for Christian principles, you will be persecuted. You will be lambasted. You will be uh, accused of everything else in this world. All right. But that's, we're trying to be what God wants us to be. But he said, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. He said, evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse possibly from inside the church, but there were definitely going to be those from outside the church, imposters, evil men, and they're deceiving and being deceived. So one of the things you see over and over again as Paul is writing to the churches, as well as this young preacher here, in his last words is he says, listen, there's a lot of deception out there. There's a lot of false teaching out there. So you need to be aware of this, Timothy, and you need to understand up front that there's, it's going to happen. So you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. How do we learn? Experience a lot of times by actually doing something. But we also learn a lot of things by listening. It's by words, right? And it's important to remember and think about that in that respect. One of the things we're going to see a lot with the various philosophies that are out there today is they place more emphasis upon feelings and emotions than actual words. You know, the problem with that is, and I'll go ahead and say it, but we will discuss it further. The problems with emotions and feelings sometimes is they can lead us astray. Give you a quick example. Suppose you get home tonight. Somebody that you love very, very much you get word on the telephone that say your wife or your husband has died. You're going to be devastated. You'll probably break down in tears. You will sit down and think and think, Oh my, what, is, what am I going to do now? How's my life going to change now? All right. Now what caused that emotion of sorrow? Somebody expressed to you words about what was going on. All right. Now, 
Let's just stop and think about this for just a moment. So you are mourning and you are weeping and you want to know, you want to know all the details about why this loved one died and the way they died. And you are, you are on a roller coaster. You are in the depths of despair. You are weeping. And then all of a sudden somebody comes in and says, what's the matter? And they said, well, you, you tell them as much as you can through the tears. You say, well, they, they said my wife, my mate died. And the other person said, no, I just saw them. They're coming up the walk right now. You mean they're coming up the wall? That means they're still alive? Yeah. Now you go from the emotion of utter despair to what? Overjoy. And what's changed? Well, number one, obviously the first thing you heard was a lie. Number two, what? You've gone from this down in the depths to enjoy because they are alive, right? And again, it's because of words. Now, you see, that's what the problem with emotions. Emotions, a lot of times, are affected by the truths that we have. The problem is with emotions, too, is you can't always believe your emotions. That's subjectivism. And you see, we've got to have some standard besides just emotions to decide if something is right or wrong. That's going to be a key thing that we talk about as we look at this. So you see, as Paul is saying this, he says, listen, he says, I want you to continue in the things you have learned and you've been assured of. He says, knowing from whom you learned them, then from childhood, you have known what? The scriptures. So what is Paul, as he's talking about this, what is the standard? It's the scriptures. From a child, you have known the scriptures. The scriptures won't guide you wrong. All right. <clears throat> which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ. And then this passage that we all look, we all memorize all scripture. How much scripture? All. All right. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word inspiration comes from a Greek word, a, a combined Greek word, theopneustia, which means God breathed. God breathed these words. Now, again, you're hearing a lot of people today that are attacking scripture and saying, no, that's just what some men wrote. It's just what they thought. They, they, according to them, according to some people, well, they may have been deluded into thinking it. They may have dreamed a dream. Remember Daniel would prophesy or give an interpretation of the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, so you will find some of this did. He, Ezekiel sees a lot of visions, all right? So they look at these examples that we read in scripture sometimes and they say, well, they're just something that they made up in their mind and it's not from God. What does Paul say? It's inspired by God. God breathed these words. So the writers of the Bible really are nothing more than messenger boys or girls. All right. Depending on who wrote it. That's the bottom line. I was always taught and I never will forget this. Whenever I was in preacher training school, I was taught, listen, you're just a messenger boy. You're just a messenger boy. Now I'm going to date myself. Whenever my dad was in the, he had been sent to Vietnam the first time. He had saw two tours of duty. He was wounded in action there that first time. And I will forget the day. I'm going to talk about emotions. I never will forget the day when Western Union brought us a telegram saying my dad had been wounded in combat. And I never will forget my mom weeping. And come to find out later, he was leading a patrol, and he was the sergeant in charge of patrol, and he had told the point man to stay off the trail. The guy walked on the trail, set off a booby trap. Some of the shrapnel came across his chest and blew the guy's leg off. Okay. And I never will forget that, but I don't want you to remember this. Here's the point. What was more important, the guy who brought the message or the message? The message was the most important thing. I couldn't tell you to this day what that guy looked like. I, I, don't, I, I remember him knocking at the door, giving us the telegram. That's all I remember. The message was what important. 
So he emphasized, as I was going through school, they emphasized, you're just the messenger boy. You're just the telegram deliverer. The message is what's important. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The word profitable mean? It's worth, worth, something. worth something, right. It's profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine, in other words, is teaching. All right? For reproof. How can I know whether I'm right or wrong? Scripture, you see? That's the standard. If I was to listen to the world standard, then anything goes. And my standard is my standard, and you can't judge my standard. Well, if we believe that we are Christians, as we do, then automatically now we have a different standard, right? And that different standard is going to judge us is going to be God's word. John 12, verse 48. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him at the last day. Okay? Matthew chapter 7. In the last few sentences of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, <clears throat> he said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a man that built his house upon the rock. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the wind blew and built upon, or beat upon that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. All right, now what is he saying? He said, whenever you're listening to my words and you're building your life upon that, the storms will come. The storms will come, but you're going to stand firm. But whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, it's like a man building his house upon the stands. And the storms are going to come there. And then as all the children love to do, this foolish man builds his house upon the sand. And then what? <laughs> foolish man's house went flat. All right. So there you go. All right, so here he's saying, he's saying, here's our, here's our standard. It's, it's for reproof, for correction, for instruction, teaching, and the training, discipline. This word instruction can include all of that. It's training in righteousness. Now think about that word training for just a moment. Training means that you've got to go through some hard times. You, you've got to, if I'm going through, <clears throat> a few years ago, I ran, for, I ran in the Peace Tree Road Race. Okay? I never won. Somebody would always ask, well, well, you know, <clears throat> well, where were you? Well, I was behind the first guy that crossed the line. I'm not going to tell you how far behind I was, but I was, I, I finished the race. All right. But before then I would train, I would run, I would run 15, 20 miles a week. Okay. And, and that was my way of relieving a lot of stress but it also created hill spurs that had to be operated on, and now I can't run like I used to, okay? And so the bottom line is structure and righteousness, training. Scripture is there to train us to become more what we need to be for correction, for instruction and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. King James says perfect. The word perfect can be translated complete more often than not. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, that, that passage emphasizes so much to us right there. This is God's inspired word. This, if we live by it, will guide us, help us to know what we're supposed to do, how to live. It will show us where we got wrong. It will show us how to correct our lives. It will give us that instruction in righteousness. All right, go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. How did we get the scriptures? Well, 2 Peter is going to tell us of this. 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> he said, beginning in verse 16, he said, We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, at the time that John and some of these others were writing, they were beginning to deal with a heresy at the church, in the church at that time, called the Gnostics. And they believed that Jesus had not come in the flesh. So you begin to start reading, especially in 1 John, uh, where he says, that which we have seen, we've heard, our hands have handled the word of life. John's point is, yes, he wasn't a, a figment of our imagination. He was not an apparition. He was not a ghost. He was what? He was a flesh and blood human being. All righty. 
So he says, we did not follow cunningly devised fables whenever we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And who's writing this, by the way? Peter. And who was Peter? He was the apostle. He saw him. He argued with him. He told Jesus, Lord, it's not going to happen to you what you're saying. You know, he, would, he would had enough... He had enough courage to sit down and rebuke Jesus. And Jesus kind of said, no, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have a clue. He would tell him, you're going to deny me three times. And he would do, he did that. So he said, we did not follow cunningly defined fables, but we were eyewitnesses of the majesty. The point he's trying to make is, is that we're not, we're not making this stuff up. He said, he received from God the Father honor and glory. When a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And what was he talking about? That's, he was talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter's referencing the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17 here in 1 Peter. We heard this voice, which came from heaven when we were with him. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. Now, what does the word prophet mean? What does that mean? A spokesman, that's all he is. Again, going back to the figure that I had a few minutes ago, a prophet comes, it comes from the Greek word prophetes. He is nothing more than a spokesman, a spokesman for God. When we think of prophets more often than not, we think of guys that predict future, right? That's not the way it was used in the scriptures. In the scriptures, it suggests just simply a spokesman for God. So he said, we have this prophetic word confirmed. Peter says, I was there on the mountain. I heard the voice. And it wasn't just Peter. It was James and John that were there. Yes. Anytime you think about it, verse 16, where it said, well, I witnessed that's the first hand account. That's right. This is not third and fourth series legend. This is, this is the first hand account. That's exactly right. And I went, what is eyewitness testimony? You, saw the actual, you actually saw it. Now, eyewitness testimony, and this, this, again, this is, you get into more details with this when you start discussing uh, how do we know the Bible is true. I'm just trying to touch on these things very quickly because we've got to use this as the basis. But if you were to go into a court of law, you might have two or three eyewitnesses. They all might see, they might have seen the same accident, but they might all have been seeing it from a different viewpoint. But if all of them could testify to the fact of what actually happened, then that fact would be proven to be true. If, for example, we walk out and we walk up here to Piedmont Road, and Piedmont Road has never had an accident on it, but anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. Okay, and we're all going there, and we're just up there just walking along the road, and all of a sudden right there in front of us, there's a huge accident. Every one of us will see the fact of that accident. Some of us would see maybe the color of the cars involved or what kind of cars involved. Most of us guys would be worried about that. All right. The two ladies in this class, they would be looking at the ladies that got out of the car and what they were wearing. Most of us guys, what are you talking about? I don't, what, well, at least she's clothed. You know, that's all that matters. She's clothed. But you would be able to tell us everything about the ladies. We would be able to tell you everything about the cars. And we would be able to sit down and tell us, you know, and all of us together and say, okay, now this is what happened. They had stopped for this person trying to cross the road, this other guy come in and pow, you know, hit him, in the, hit him in the back. That's the fact of the matter. So Peter and James and John were there. They saw all of these things. They witnessed all of these things. There's that eyewitness testimony. You're right. So he said, we have this prophetic word confirmed. What it was confirmed about it. Whenever he was on the mountain, he heard God speak. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay, that wasn't enough, but he got James and John and can say the same thing. At the mouth of two or three witnesses in the Old Testament law, what? Every word should be established. So he says, which you do well to heed. Do well to heed what? The prophetic word as a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawn arises and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this first, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, I don't like that phrase interpretation there, that, that's, that thing. A better Greek word there, or a better interpretation, no 
scripture or prophecy of scripture is of any private origin. In other words, people didn't make this up. These guys that wrote it down, they wrote it down because this is what God said. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men, set apart men, men who spoke from God, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The word moved there is the Greek word, which means you were, they were born along. The same word is used in Acts chapter 27, where it talks about the ship that Paul was on right before it shipwrecked, and that wind blew it along. So these men were carried along by what God said. All right? Even though these human beings were used in the process of writing down God's word, they were born along by the Spirit. They were not the originators or the carriers of God's message. It's God's word. He's not going to let men divert, misdirect, or erroneously record his message. God moved. The prophet wrote these words down. God revealed, and they recorded his word. And that's it. The Old Testament over and over again recognizes that it is the Holy Spirit that speaks through his writers. All right? The Holy Spirit guiding them. Look in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 23. I have a question to okay. About that. okay. Just to mention, so like, <clears throat> by the prophet's own interpretation, um, mm -hmm. I guess it made me think about just like personality. Mm -hmm. And like when I read like Paul's writings as mm -hmm. opposed to like James, mm -hmm. like, I'm not the biggest fan of Paul because he tends to be sarcastic and he comes back with a lot of questions mm -hmm. instead of just like directly answering the thing. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed when I read the text and I read, I, I can pick up on the different spokesmen, as you say. Right. So I think to some extent, like, yeah, I feel like God is speaking through these people and, mm -hmm. uh, to write that. But I think a, a part of who they are in their identity with God comes out. That's exactly right. And God's able to do that because he created all of us with different personalities. And again, he's able to use those personalities, and you you do see there the different styles in every do one of them. Do you think that that could be why maybe sometimes people have different interpretations of why certain things are? Yeah, I think it could be. But the thing that we really got to think about, and this is what I think he's trying to stress, is the idea that it's up to us. God has given us the word, so therefore it's up to us to dig it out, to get the real truth, to get the truth, as opposed to cursorily, you know what I'm talking about. Some people read scripture and then some people study scripture. So a lot of people, and what I'm trying to say is this, you're gonna look at it from your viewpoint, from your background, from your raising and so forth, but at the same time, it's not going to change what scripture says. You may the look core, at it slightly different. Truths, yeah, the that core truth. That's right. And what you're saying, what are you saying the core truths are? Okay. And again, that's as we continue to look through this, we're going to, the whole, all the Bible is the core truth. All right. So we've got to understand that message. And we've got to understand it the way that it was written. So, yeah, Paul was so a little bit sarcastic. The way that it's written yeah. Within the context. And with whatever book or church. Right. And you see, that's what happens a lot of times. And even we in the church have made this mistake. We take verses out of context and make them say things that they, God never intended for them to say. We can't do that. And we of all people better not be doing that. And I think, again, we, we, we've gone that way a lot of times. And again, I, I understand why we're preachers. And a lot of times we'll go and reference a passage a lot of times. But it's gotten to where... <clears throat> It's gotten to where when I'm preaching now, I stopped, I've stopped just taking one verse and reading it. I'll sit down and explain the context of the whole thing. And, I, and that's what I've been trying to do here tonight. And that's what I'm going to continue to try to do because I think so many times when we take verses out of context, we make them a pretext for anything. You can just prove by just anything, taking verses and jumbling them together. So, in everything that I'm going to be trying to do as I'm looking at this from what the Bible says, I'm going to be trying to look at the context of what's going on and why and, and so forth like that. So 2 Timothy was referenced because it's inspired. 2 Peter is because it's prophetic. That's 
that's the strain of what you're going on. And he still, and, and even there, the point that he's trying to make in Second Peter was what? These words that we, I am writing, Second Peter chapter 1, are confirmed by the miracles that I saw, my eyewitness testimony. Now, you see, Paul had seen the Lord in a different context, right? Totally different context. So he would write about it in a totally different context than Peter would. Okay? So always, 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 always look at the passage in light of the context. Look at the passage in light of the paragraph. Look at the passage in light of the chapter. Look at the passage in light of the book. And then look at the passage in light of the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. So, yes, sir. <clears throat> That's why sometimes when you read the scripture, you have to read the other scripture before, before you get to that. Right. That's right. And I, uh, here's my opinion. Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> Most Bibles today are broken down like this one. Okay, where you've got these verses and every verse is a paragraph. And you've got these chapters, okay? And a lot of times when we're doing our Bible reading, I want to read my Bible today. So we will look at every one of these verses as a paragraph by themselves. No, 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 no. Don't, 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 no, no. I think one of the, I understand why they divided the Bible this way to make it easier for us to find things, but it's also crippled us because we think that every verse is a paragraph, an idea by itself. No, 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 no. You've got to look at the entire thing, okay? So that's the reason why I'm trying to read more of my Bible reading. It's going to be more out of the, out of the Bibles that are putting things in paragraphs. Let me also say this, and this is just me, but I believe there's some chapter divisions. <laughs> that are way off, <laughs> way, way off, okay? That that chapter should not have stopped there and started there. That, no, 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 no. To get the whole idea, you've got to read on into the next chapter. So, sometimes the next book. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. So that's important, all right? So as Peter was writing, he's emphasizing the idea of what? He said, I'm trying to tell you in no uncertain terms that I saw these things. So these words that I'm writing, these prophetic words are from God, just like all these other guys as they were writing. These things came from God. All righty. 2 Samuel 23, verse 2 and 3. Listen to what he said. These are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse. Thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his tongue and word was on my tongue. All right, and does that tell us a little bit about inspiration? Number one, the Spirit spoke by me. Secondly, then he says what? His word was on my tongue. All right? The rock of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He, no, those, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. So who spoke to him? The God of Israel. The rock of Israel. And what did he say? He says, he who rules over men must be just. So he's claiming inspiration. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word, the spirit of the Lord's word, was on my tongue. So as you're reading and listening to what I'm saying, you would understand that this is God's word, not, not my word. All right? <clears throat> over and over and over again, this, this idea is brought out. For example, in Psalms 95, verse 7, uh, this passage is quoted in Hebrews 3, verse 7, and the Hebrew writer would say, the Holy Spirit said. But in Psalms 95, it was the psalmist. Psalms 45, verse 6. Hebrews 1, verse 8. God said. See, Hebrews 1, verse 8 is a quote from Psalms 45, verse 6. The book of Hebrews is one of those that's quoting the Old Testament over and over and over again. And why? Because it's trying to bring out that we're no longer under that Old Testament law. Isaiah 7, 14 prophesied of the virgin birth, right? <clears throat> so he says, uh, the Lord spoke by the prophet, Matthew 1, 22 and 23. Qu 
quoting from Isaiah 7, 14. Hosea said, Hosea 11, verse 1, Matthew 2, verse 1, the Lord spoke by the prophet. Whose words are these? God's words, all right? Isaiah 59, 21, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words have I put in thy mouth. My words have I put in thy mouth. All right, Jeremiah 1 verse 9, the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, I have put my words where? In your mouth. All right, Zechariah 7 12, they made their hearts an adamant stone lest they should hear the law and the words which the whole Lord of hosts sent to send his spirit in the form of prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Why? Because they were not listening. So God used human beings to communicate his words, who was in charge? The spirit. Spirit was in charge of the process so that no human error would come in there. All righty. So we understand that again, you see this over and over again. You see that uh, John 14, 26, he would say that the spirit, talking to the disciples, he would say, the spirit shall bring all things to your remembrance. Right? John 16, 13, the spirit is going to guide you into all truth. All right. If he guides you into all truth, does that leave any truth out? No, no. All right. <clears throat> so as you think about this, whenever we mentioned second Peter Timothy chapter three earlier, uh, in first Timothy chapter five, verse 18, it seems like he quotes from Luke chapter 10 verse seven. So what does that mean? In all probability, well, obviously, Luke had been written before Paul wrote 1 Timothy. For him to quote from Luke. So that would argue, and what did he say? This was scripture. All righty. All righty. In 2 Peter chapter 3, and <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Hebrews, James, of course, the second Peter. Do y'all have to do that on some Huh? No? Okay. Good for you. All right. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Beloved, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, knowing that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all of his epistles, speaking in them, in these things, which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. What is Peter saying? By inspiration, Peter's saying that Paul's writings are inspired. Okay? So the emphasis is, is that's it. He, he emphasizes this. How did Jesus look at scripture? Again, Whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a man that builds his house upon the rock. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he emphasizes the idea that he did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And once the law was fulfilled, then that was it. There was an infallibility to it. So again, so many passages. He said, First Timothy or First Corinthians chapter two, verse thirteen. Paul would write, and he says, "Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual." So what's he saying? I didn't make this stuff up. God inspired me to write these things. These words are taught by the Spirit. He says, "Listen, First Corinthians chapter fourteen and verse thirty-seven." If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write are the commandments of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you did not receive it as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the what? The word of God. Okay? So again, all that Paul is saying is what? These aren't my words. These are God's words. They were the commandments of the Lord. 
He will say in Galatians 1, he said, if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than what we have preached, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 8 and 9. So, you know, <laughs> we could go on and on and on and on and on. But you see the point that, that has to be made here. And what is that point? Is that God's word is the truth. All right, let's take about another five minute break and come right back. And then we're actually like going to get into the book. All right, we're actually going to get into this. I think this set the tone for everything else. All right, quick five minute break. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, if you go to, uh, if, are you on Facebook? Go to Publishing Book and become their friend. They have posted the school community. It was about that one of the best sermons that I had because it talked about the action. Oh, was he there? Yeah. Yes. I was, wow. it. I was, I was told. Okay. Yeah, I was told. So, so no, polish in the pulpit on Facebook. If you're not, be friends now. Okay. Uh -huh. And type in Don Blackwell Shorter and polish in the pulpit. Okay. Okay. And you can watch that show. He's in the wheelchair. He's in the wheelchair and everything. Yeah. What's he doing? He's doing. <laughs> He posted after he got back from publishing the book. They were in their house and they had these contractors renovating their house for the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. He taught the gospel and baptized four of them. <laughs> <laughs> he taught them the gospel like and baptized four of them. He couldn't, of course, he didn't do it, but he said somebody else baptized them. But I taught them the gospel and four of those contractors were in their house. <laughs> so he hadn't stopped. You know what I'm saying? Don Blackwell, growing up as a member of the North Charleston Church of Christ, he and I were members when we met, and I was baptized. We were going to North Charleston because I was stationed at the time, and we knew Don's. I remember Don's mom. I don't remember him as a young boy. No, no, I've had that conversation a few times about how we the congregation at the same time. So has, he, has he regained any of his faculty or is he still mm -hmm. he's still pretty messed up? I mean, is he, he's a choir, is he a choir pleaser? Or? No, he's not. He's not. Okay. So he's able to roll around himself and all that other stuff. So he's able to roll around himself and all that other stuff. Sorry. Where is this? Okay. Frank here goes to dialysis three days a week. Mm -hmm. he, I pick him up to dialysis to have a place. From where? From dialysis to have a place. Wow. He's been on dialysis for 20 years? 30 years? Um, oh, the Lord is in the Lord is going to take the gate here. That's right. What? Do you need to be on? I'm not familiar with that. Well, it's like your kidneys aren't working. Yeah, oh, okay. And so mm -hmm. they have to take all the impurities out of your body to have a change. Okay. It takes about two and a half hours for a long three and a half hours. Three times 
get mom service, the chemicals that burn the kidneys. Most people with dialysis is because they're diabetic. That's right. But if he wasn't diabetic, he's not diabetic. But it's from the kidney damage. 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 Okay, let's go ahead for about the last 25 minutes, all right? Thank you for hanging in there with us. We're going to now go into the actual book. I've given you a lot to look at from the scriptural viewpoint. We will keep coming back to scripture over and over and over again as we continue to come through this and start talking about these issues. In the first chapter, he emphasizes what Christian ethics is all about. Again, on that page 15 there, ethics deal with what is right and wrong morally. All right, so he then starts talking about what Christian ethics is. Number one, and I like this, it's form of the divine command position. And eth it's ethics, an ethical duty is something we ought to do. Well, who tells us what we ought to do? Well, when we're growing up, as our parents, right? And if we don't, we have to pay the penalty. All right, as we grow older, we kind of sit back and say, well, I can make my own decisions. And a lot of times we make those decisions, but we are created in God's image. We are God's creation. Therefore, does he have the right to tell us what to do? Absolutely. And again, where else are we going to get this? From subjective feelings? Well, we talked about that a few moments ago. No, the only way we can know is from what the Bible says in his word. And that's the reason I spent the last hour talking about this in a lot of detail, because if we don't believe that the Bible is inspired, if we do not believe that the Bible, uh, if we do not believe the Bible is inspired, if we do not believe that um, God wrote it, then what? Your opinion and your ideas go for you, and my opinion and my ideas go for me, and that's where we are culturally in this country, right? Don't judge me for my opinion. Well, if, if the only standard is my opinion and your opinion, and your opinion is as good as my opinion, then what? We have no standard of right and wrong. That's it. So the opinion of a child molester, the opinion of a murderer, that that child needs to be molested or that that person needs to be murdered is just as good as your opinion and my opinion that that's wrong. So if that's the case, and we take that to its logical conclusion, where would we get? We would be in totally a nation without laws. And that's by and large where we get down to a lot of things with a lot of people. Well, you can't say that I'm wrong. And you can't, how often do we hear that even in the church? Well, you can't say that that's wrong. I'm not trying to tell you that's wrong. That's what God says. You've got to take that up with him. But we get mad at the person telling us that, right? That's, that's you know, you, you, and again, well, you're just judgmental. No, I'm not trying to be judgmental. All I did is show you what the Bible says. Now, you've got to come to grips with that. Now, will you believe it or not? If you choose not to, just understand this is the consequences. But if you choose to, this is what you need to do. That's the only thing we can do whenever it comes to talking to people about their souls or anything else. And that's the reason why we need to do that. So God does have the right to tell us what to do. God is unchangeable. Malachi 3, verse 16. I am the Lord. He says, I change not. Now, here's the beauty of this. Because God never changes, then we can also know that God's will will never change. What God says is right is right, 
what God says is sin is sin. And we can sit back all day long and judge that. You can judge it and I can judge it, but it's still not going to change anything if we believe that God exists and that he is unchangeable. So when we start talking about Christian ethics, then we need to understand that, again, he has the right to tell us what to do. It's based upon who he is and his character. And he challenges each and every one of us. He would tell his disciples, Matthew 5, verse 48, you shall be perfect just as what? Your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, of course, we start looking at this word perfect, and then we start saying, well, I can never be like God. So a lot of folks just quit. Yes, ma'am? I had a question here. I think it talks about God's will flows. God's will flows from his and from his unchanging nature. So I was curious. Well, on 15, it talks about God's will, God's will, what is right in accordance to his own moral attributes. Mm -hmm. First, I wondered um, how you defined his moral attributes. Like, what was, would you have defined that based on the scriptures you read earlier? That's right. And then my second question on page 15 was uh, in that second part God's will flows necessary from his unchanging nature. Can you define the difference between God's will? Like, what's the difference between the will and the nature? And is there a difference? And can they have difference in different situations? I think he goes on later to talk about the will and the nature. Right. I think in this particular book, he's emphasizing this. I think, again, his nature is his will would be what he tells us what to do. All okay, right. And how to live. Like it. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's like, you know, you telling your children what to do. That's your okay, will. Like but, it, right. but it comes from your character, too. When you're telling your children to do a certain thing, it's coming from your character. So you're saying, in, in, like, the will is like the Ten Commandments, and then the nature would be love, joy, peace. That's right. Part. That's right. That's how you're defining, or is that how he That's where I think, that's what I'm thinking he's defining it, and that's the way I'm looking at it from that viewpoint. Because our will stems from our character, and then God's will stems from his character. So if he's unchangeable, his will will be unchangeable. If God is a God of love, and he is, then his will is going to reflect that love. So this immediately then comes into play. Well, how, how can God, who is so loving, command? We'll talk about this later when we start talking about war and all this other stuff, but here's one of those things. How did God, and how could God in his justice command that the children of Israel destroy the Canaanites. You know, this is where people start struggling with this. Well, again, it still stems from his character of who he is. God, because he's God, cannot stand the side of sin, Habakkuk 1 at verse 13. So he cannot stand sin. And it's not because he hates his creation as much as he hates what sin has done to his creation. Sin has ruined our lives. Sin causes us to do our own thing. Sin causes us to break our relationships with others. Marriage, divorce, and remarriage. When we start talking about a lot of every relation that we have, true or false, every relation we have on earth is sometimes a struggle. Amen? Because we're humans. We're not perfect. And what we think ought to be my character, my will, is going to collide with somebody else's character and will. But if you and I both are striving to be like Jesus, trying to have his character, emulate his character, his will, then we're going to come a lot closer to being united than we ever will be trying to get it on our own. So when you have problems in the church, when you have problems in the family, what is it? It comes because if we're Christians, we're going to work through them as opposed to writing one another off. And we have a lot to learn. <laughs> okay. It goes on further to say that other commands flowing from God's will, but not necessarily from his nature. So mm -hmm. in that sentence, it seems to contradict what you're just saying about his will. Well, again, if you're bringing this on down to the next paragraph, where he's talking about Christian ethics is absolute. Is that right? So he, he uh, not everything wills from necessarily from his unchanging nature. For example, he gave the God chose to test Adam and Eve's moral obedience by what? Giving them the command. 
and forbidding them to eat a specific true on a tree. It was morally wrong for Adam and Eve to disobey that command, but we're not under that command anymore. Why? Because that was a specific plan to them at that time to test them. Now think about it in this respect. Does God allow us to be tested all the time? So we can take that same path of logic that you said that we're no longer under that command to go forward with other topics? Well, it depends. we're going to have to understand that from the context of the other passages. So example, we're going to find later that God is going to say, you shall not commit adultery. All right. He's going to make that very clear in the Old Testament in one of the Ten Commandments. Is it found in the New Testament? Absolutely. So you see, in that respect, and think about how does that, how does that particular command reflect God's character? Well, adultery is a breaking of a covenant, but there's more to it than that, obviously. It's also the breaking of a relationship. What has God wanted with man from the very beginning of time? What has God's will or God's desire for man from the very beginning of time been? A relationship with us. That's the reason why he has not destroyed the world yet, because God is a long-suffering, merciful, gracious God. A idea brought out in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, and quoted at least six other times in the Old Testament, and definitely brought out by Jesus is death on the cross. It took Jesus' death on the cross to save us from our sins. God punishes sin because of what it does to us. So as he's emphasizing this idea, there are some sins that, are, that was wrong in the Old Testament that are wrong today. That particular situation with Adam and Eve was different because why? Well, they were the only two people on the face of the earth. It was one simple command. And we go back to this, and, and this gets us into even, and again, we're getting into a lot of philosophy here, but think about this. Why did God give them a command? Well, let's think about this for just a minute. Did God love them? Yes. Absolutely. I have no doubt in your mind about that. Did God love them? Absolutely. All right. Now, when we start talking about love, Here's another one of those things that our culture has really changed the definition of. And this is something that I see more and more and more. If you change the definition of a word, then you can make it say anything you want it to say. So as you listen to the Hallmark Channel, love is this special giddy feeling that you feel when you see somebody and you just, you know, you just got to be with them for the rest of your life. And they've taken that word love to be what? A feeling, an emotion, all right? God, in the scriptures, emphasized the idea that God is a God of love. Love in scriptures is not so much an emotion as much as it is a choice. God chose to allow us to have a choice. Because, you see, he couldn't really say if we loved him, if we were forced to be in that relationship with him and didn't have a choice. So when he gave them that command, he gave them, in essence, a choice. I've given you everything you need and everything you can want. You're living in a perfect world. And this is, again, this is another three-hour session right here, <laughs> okay? But think about it just for a moment. When God gave that command in Genesis 2, 17, he said, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat thereof. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall what? Surely die. Now, I want you to stop for just a moment and think about that concept. There had been no death at that time. Nothing had died. It was a perfect world. So, you're automatically sitting there with the kind of deal of, did they really understand what concept of death was? Well, again, what do we say that the death is? Well, it's when the spirit leaves the body. James chapter two emphasizes that idea without the body, without the spirit is dead. But did they really understand what death was? Well, God said we don't do it because in the day that we do it, then we're going to die. He gave them a choice. Now, will they love God enough 
to obey his command, well, they love God as much as he loved them. Well, we know the rest of the story. Genesis 3 says Satan comes on the scene. By the way, I want to challenge your thoughts on this as well. I grew up listening to Flip Wilson saying the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make us do anything. All right. We, it's our choice. But think about this. How do we have choices? Through words. God gave them a choice. He did it through words. When Satan come on the scene, he did it through words. Did God say? What's Satan doing? Trying to create doubt. All right. Now think about that for a moment. Did God say? And she said, well, notice this. This is interesting. I don't know how many of you ever really noticed this. But Eve is there. He says, God said we should not take of this, nor touch it. No, 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 no. God didn't say you couldn't touch it. Where did he get, where did she get that? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. But I also think if you look at the context very closely in John 2, 17, the only person told God told that to was Adam. Eve hadn't yet been created. Genesis 2, 18 is when he created Eve and made the marriage. So now the man was supposed to tell his wife what God wanted. Where did she get that idea that you shall not touch it? I think God told him. Now, let's think about this for just a minute. Chapter one describes, yeah, you have two creation events there. The creation event of Genesis chapter two gives more detail as to how women got in the scene and as opposed to Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one kind of broad, broad strokes it. Genesis chapter two gets in a very narrow, how did the woman come on the scene? All right, and we remember in the first operation ever created, what happened? <laughs> I mean, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Something. yeah. So, so, but it, I mean, it does imply in Genesis yeah. 1 that the woman was there. Yeah, but again, I think Genesis 1 was more of a broader stroke. Genesis 2, here's how she got there. Okay? Study it, all right? No, I have. Yeah. Okay. I have. I do okay. Know okay, so, and, and I'm just trying, every time I say this, everybody needs to study. Where did she get it? I think she got it from Adam. Not That's to it. Touch Don't touch truth. it. Yeah. Why would she get it from God if she was in relationship with God? And again, if you look at the context, she probably was told this by Adam. Was she in a relationship with God? Did Adam add a few words to it? Do we sometimes tell our children not to touch something and the moment we tell them not to touch something, what happens? They point, got to. Adam's having authority over that hasn't been well, it hasn't in really entered until after the sin, fall. the fall, right. Genesis chapter 3. So she, he wouldn't have, by that logic, he wouldn't have said that. Okay, that's a good point. But I've always thought for myself that either A, she had, had, to, have heard, had, had to have heard it from Adam. Okay, now that's just me. Now, maybe I've implied something there. I shouldn't. Thank you for that. So think about this. Adam was there when she took of the tree. Because she gave it, she gave it to Adam. Now, we've often, and I've often made the point, if he was doing his job, he would have stopped her. You see, we can get into those discussions. But we see we're trying to make a lot, we're trying to understand a lot about a situation that we can only catch from the first part there. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that this, where did that happen? Well, God said this to see and to test their love. And the only way, the only way that he could know they loved them was whether or not they made the right choice. As opposed to what they felt. Yes. When we look at God, his character, what we want to call his character or his attributes, mm -hmm. and we're talking about love, uh, we know that he loves, mm -hmm. he's pure, he's almighty. We know that he hates sin. Mm -hmm. How could he be God? How could he display his attributes mm -hmm. without somebody to display him too? How right. could he love 
when our subject love and love him back. And love him back. How could yeah. he express his wrath without giving command follow where his discipline can come in? Right. So he can't be God, he can't display his attributes without man. Okay. So therefore, okay, I'm a loving God, so I've got this creation that I'm gonna love. I'm Adam and Eve, I'm gonna provide for them. Yeah. But in return, I want a relationship. So in order to have a relationship, show them a loving God, mm -hmm. and I need to tell them different things to do. Right. We have a relationship. But being God, his other side is he hates sin, mm -hmm. and he hates disobedience. So in order to exercise his hate for sin, and his hate for disobedience, he has to give a command. If the command is not followed, then he has to exercise his displeasure with disobedience. Right. So man comes along. Now, because man's here, now God can exercise everything that he is because of man. Right. And that's, you know, and again, we're, we've got to be very, 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 very careful about a lot of this because, again, one of the things I'm, I'm aware of, you know, when we think about God, we think about him holy, just, loving. We, we, no matter how hard we try, we can't totally wrap, wrap our mind around his attributes. The way he loves us with an unfailing love. I don't know that we can ever really understand that. It's not something you feel. It's a choice he makes for mankind. When you start thinking about how, he can, how can he be everywhere at once? I can't wrap my mind around that. He's eternal. I can't understand eternity because what? Everything I know has had a beginning. So here, again, we've got to be very, very, very careful that we don't... I'm trying to say the best way to say this. That we don't paint God into a corner because God is greater than anything we can imagine. Or any one that we can imagine. Yeah. Talk me through it, Hunter, because you think the fact that we have a finite mind. Mm -hmm. It's hard for a finite mind to understand anything. That's right. And it's hard for us to, that have, that are in a time uh, continuum, it's hard for us to understand eternity. And it's hard for me to understand how anybody can be everywhere at once. I try, I can't do it. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? So the bottom line is, we've got to be very careful. And, and I appreciate this is part of the reason why I love to teach because your feedback helps me to grasp that too, but also reminds me we've got to be very, very careful lest we get across that. So that's the point I'm trying to make. So as we start talking about love and we start talking about God and how it all started off, we have to understand that this did come from his character, who he is. This also, his will come from that character, much like, our will, the way we were raised and the way, excuse me, reared, the way we were reared is going to affect how we rear our children. And the way we rear them is going to affect how they're going to rear their children. And it's going to continue on and on and on. So when we start looking at this in a lot of detail, when we start talking about God's character, we've got to understand that Christian ethics stem from his character. And so when we start talking about will and so forth, that's where we're talking about. And this is where, again, we can get down into these philosophical matters, all right? God is love, true or false? First John 4, 16, Hebrews 6, 18, Matthew 5, verse 48. So he's never going to do anything that's going to be contrary to his love, all right? God is all-knowing, yeah, all right? Well, then God is never going to do anything it's going to be contrary to that. Now, you're sitting there thinking, how could that be if he knows everything? Huh? So you see where automatically now my mind just exploded? You see what I'm trying to say? Because I can't fathom he knows everything because I don't know everything, and I don't know what that would be like in that respect. So. Let me give you an example of that. I'm saying initially I wouldn't even know more. Uh -huh. He knows everything, but there are some things he chooses not to remember. He chooses not to remember. And that's the way we explain that's that. His character and that's his character. He chooses. He chooses. Not to remember. Chooses not to, and that's, think about that. That's what love is. We choose. My wife and I have been married 38 years. And, and, uh, 
39. It's 39 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 39 years. We celebrate. Yeah, no, you don't have to, please. 39 years. Okay. My wife has forgiven a lot of things. She chooses not to remember them anymore. And I'm thankful for that. Okay. There's some, some, she's done some things that I choose not to remember anymore because I love her. But you see, the problem is, or it's not a problem, but we have a very, very, I won't say skewed, but I'm not trying to find a good word. We have a very limited view of that, whereas God is perfect in that. So, with those ideas in mind, we'll pick up there next week. Chew on that some more, all right? <laughs> it's 8.30, it's time to go. <laughs> all right, I will, and have been recording this, I will post this on the internet, so if you did not see it or you wanna go back over some of this again. By the way, again, some of this is philosophy. One thing a person said before is philosophers sit and talk about everything, come up with all these ideas, but it really doesn't change things. All right, so that's just it, and that's just understand this is where we're coming from. So try not to get too bogged down in it all. All righty, brother Tommy. Brother Tommy. No, I hope not. Okay. All, all right. right. Thank you. Thank you, brother Tommy. Yes. Uh, this is brother Ben. I texted you earlier. Uh, yeah. Uh, also remind everyone that when you say class starts at. 5.30, make sure that you tell them it's uh, Eastern time. Okay, all righty. I apologize about right. that. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll go back through and watch the footage. And then okay, back. all righty. Yeah, you are, where are you in, Ben, where are you? Henderson, Tennessee. You're in Tennessee, so that's Central time, okay? Yep. Uh, we have people that are taking this course in India mm -hmm. right now. Well, I don't even know what time it is there. <laughs> it's tomorrow morning there. So a lot of this stuff will have to be looked at later, but I will try to, I will try to remember that. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate that. All right. All right. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to get through that tonight, but it didn't happen. <laughs> so that no, that's no problem. That's fine. This is this is what it's about. We're trying to study together. So don't don't apologize. Don't absolutely don't apologize. Mm -hmm. right. So that's and it's important. That's the reason why we. That's the reason why we want to get this part down as much as we can before we start getting into the topics, so that we can understand where everybody else is coming from. Okay. All right. All right. Can I bring you back my yeah. study from it? Yeah, 6.30. Oh, that's right. Oh, what is it? Man. <laughs> you see, there we go. I've, I've already made that mistake. So I'm used to teaching to 8.30. So, uh, you're used to going 8.30. I think it says 9 on the syllabus. Yeah, right. It, it's, I'm going to 9 o'clock. I was supposed to go another 30 minutes. But I was still thinking... 830. Old, old <laughs> that's way, that's way yeah. So, okay. Yeah, 10 years of that way. So, okay. I was using the system. Now that it's semester, it's like, don't know what.